All right, so my job this morning is just to give a, a broad sweeping overview, which means I have lots of slides. So we'll go quickly. These are the mandatory slides. You want to say anything to these? All right, mandatory slides going by fast. Uh, my disclaimer, I'll be talking about lots of uh, companies. I don't have any equity in them, so if I say good things about it, I mean it. It's no financial gain to me. All right, so <clears throat> genomics has been uh, around for a long time. And it's been fueled largely by sequencing. And over the last 20 years, there was a, an evolution starting up here with the good old days of running your gels radioactively and then scoring them by hand, as you see the person doing there. Uh, there came out some gel readers that would read your gel for you. They never really worked. Uh, but then came along the, the automated fluorescent sequencing. So these are still gel-based, but uh, the, the data were collected. You had to track the, the gels. And when we got up to 96 lanes, that was actually an arduous task. And then the big development was capillary sequencers, was the real milestone, where each capillary is a single lane of sequence. And so that uh, not only did throughput go up, but it took away the, the need for tracking the gels, et cetera. And that's how the human genome was done. We were able to pack rooms full of these things, and uh, you, could, you could crank out enough data to do the human genome. But what we're really talking about here, and the reason for these courses, is that in the last, uh, since 2005, so the last about seven years, six and a half, seven years, there's been a huge revolution. In, uh, in sequencing with many new sequencers coming on the market. And as you'll see, and as you know, the amount of data being produced is just staggering. So some of the quick advantages of next gen, we are, I just said that the, the amount of data is just ridiculous that can be produced in, off one machine, as you'll see, and you're going to have to learn how to deal with that. But there's no subcloning. So libraries of, of uh, fragments for doing your, your reads on are uh, produced in bulk. Uh, unlike the human genome, we had to actually prep every single clone. Uh, to sequence. That was uh, a very, very rate limiting step. Uh, as you'll see, you can readily adapt it to many, many different uh, uh, applications. Uh, and also, that there's been a huge uh, reduction in cost, which opened up the possibility to do many more experiments. So, the first one on the market came out in 2005. This is the 454 from Roche. Uh, this is the paper describing it. And I'm going to go through a little bit on the technologies. Um, just so everyone's familiar and up to speed. So there's a, a wide range of expertise in the room. So we'll, we'll sort of start basic and, and uh, pick up pace as we go. But almost all of them, uh, except some of the newer ones perhaps, start by taking the, the genome you want to sequence and fragmenting it, and then putting on it some adapters that are specific to the type of platform you're using. Uh, then that is, uh, in this case, in the 454, you have to amplify the signal. So they use a bead. And this is an emulsion PCR, so it's a droplet in an oil-based uh, emulsion and many, many droplets, millions of little droplets. And in the ideal world, in each droplet, you have a bead, which has complementary oligos on it to these adapters. And by PCR, essentially, in the, within that droplet, you coat the entire bead with those sequences to get more copies of it. In the 454, these beads are then dropped into what they call the Pico teeter plate, which is a fused bunch of, of uh, uh, glass fibers. And then they're etched with acid to make these little wells. So the beads go in there. You pack in the enzymes you need with more beads just by centrifuging. And this uh, packs it in there and keeps the, the beads in place. And then the detection is through a luciferase uh, cascade. And some light is released. And this is a, an electron micrograph of what it looks like. Oops. Hate the animation. So with the kind of data that came out was very new to us. We were used to looking at the sequence traces. Uh, this came out in what we call flowgrams. And we call it that because each base is flowed one at a time. Uh, unlike the, the, Sang the Sanger sequence we've been doing where all four bases are present. So each one comes one at a time. And if there are multiple bases, you get more signal. So in this case, you can see this roughly, uh, this, this is the signal for one. And this is many T's in a row, so you get a, a larger signal. The problem with it is it wasn't quite linear, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, the next one on the market was Selexa, which got bought by Illumina. Uh, a good deal for them, as it turned out. And they got rid of the beads, and what they do is actually amplify on a, a solid surface. So here's the same idea. You've got your little fragment, and it anneals to uh, oligos now on a, a slide surface. And then through sort of a bridging PCR back and forth, you build little clusters of, of the same molecule being copied many, many times. And then that's sequenced uh, by extension. So you add uh, one base at a time, or sorry, all four bases at once, but they're, they have a block on it, so only one base is added at a time. And then uh, it's uh, fluorescently imaged here. And you can just follow the sequence. This, the output in this was, uh, was really in bases, but it was uh, still a little different. It was intensity, signal intensities, but it was very similar. So we were, could readily grasp the, the compared to the, the older types of data that we we're used to. This is the, an inside of one of the old, uh, this is actually when you can tell it's aluminum because it's blue. 
uh, but this is a very early instrument. And you can see it's really a microscope slide. I have some visual aids. Uh, it's really a microscope slide here. Uh, and this is, you can see, it's just a, it's a, it's a microscope. This is an objective. Uh, robotics to move it around. This is liquid handling to put the reagents in. I'll start passing some of these around if you've never seen one. Get it open. This is one of the older style <coughs> alumina. So it's just a microscope slide. It's got eight little channels on it, a couple holes in each end to pump the, the reagents through. Uh, I'm not going to talk very much, and we won't talk very much at all about the solid. Uh, the solid came out uh, around 2007 as well. Um, it didn't do well. It did. We actually worked. We had we had some of them. Uh, it was completely different, though. It still used the emulsion PCR and covered the the bead with multiple copies to to boost the signal. But the sequencing, rather than use a polymerase, used a, a ligase. And I won't go through the whole process since we're not going to analyze the data. But it uh, it had some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and was turned out to couldn't keep up in throughput necessarily. They came out with the 5500, which is a new version. This is a flow cell from that. You can see it's uh, much larger. Similar thing to that slide that's going around. Um, it still produces uh, maybe 90 gigs of data on a good day, uh, which is nothing compared to the, the high seeks, which we'll be talking about, and which most data comes from today, which produce around 700 gigs in a row. So I'll talk a little bit about the the. Some people call them G3s, third generation. Some people just call them next, next, or just next. Next generation sequencing covers everything. Um, there are many of them that are coming out are single molecule sequencers. Not all, but many of them. Uh, there's uh, ease of sample prep, as we'll talk about, in, especially in one that's coming out. Um, less sequence bias and, and longer reads, perhaps. Uh, but uh, one of the things you'll see is that they have a, a much higher error rate. I'll be talking about that uh, towards the end. One that first came out, um, I'm not sure what year this was. 2008, I think, uh, was the Helicose Bioscience Heliscope. Um, it weighed a ton. It's a big monster. Uh, had a cluster as well. It wasn't in there. They showed it was in there, but it's actually a second 2,000 pound uh, 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 cluster. And it was, um, it was really the first single molecule sequencer, so uh, hats off to them for that. It had 50 lanes. It could do about 1 to 2 million reads in each, but they're very short. They're 25 bases. And it was the uh, same thing where the, the slide was covered with oligos. You kneel it on and then uh, you extend. Um, and it, it had an a error rate that at that time was horrendous, but you'll see some of the ones now are even worse. But it just didn't produce enough data, really, and was hard to work. So uh, I think some people still have them. Uh, the company still exists. Uh, you can still buy reagents, um, but uh, it's not in great use. Came along in uh, 2008 as well, towards the end, maybe 2009, was the PAC Bio. Uh, this is a single molecule real time, so another single molecule machine. We have one of these. Uh, the way this works is you have a, a thin membrane here with little tiny holes in it. These are uh, seven zeptoliters in volume. It's zeptoliters 10 to the minus 21 on a glass surface. And the way it was described to me by the inventor is that, uh, you know, when you, if you look at your microwave oven in the front of it, there's that little uh, panel with all the holes in it so you can see your food, but you're not cooking your face while you're watching your food, which is a good thing. Uh, and that's because the microwaves are too large to fit through those holes. And the same thing, this hole is so small that the laser light doesn't really penetrate that hole, but it does light up this bottom part here. And at the bottom of this well is a polymerase. And so it's a really cool machine because what you're doing is actually watching a polymerase uh, incorporate nucleotides while it makes DNA. So it's, it's really a, a cool device. And what's happening in, in the mixture there, you've got all the nucleotides. They're labeled on the, flo the floors on the phosphate. They're floating around in this space, going in and out of that area that's being lit up by the laser. And that's what this background chatter is here. And then uh, when one's incorporated, when the, the polymerase finds what it, it, its match and incorporates that, that's, that happens on the average of milliseconds. And so there's a, a signal increase while it, this uh, nucleotide hangs around for a while. And then when it cleaves, it incorporates and cleaves off the phosphate, the diphosphate, that drifts away, goes back to baseline, and then the next one's incorporated. This is a, a cartoon. This isn't what the data look like. This is what it, they would hope it would look like. So it's really kind of cool, though, and you can look at around 70,000 polymerases making DNA. We'll talk more about that one later. Uh, the ion torrent came out. This is uh, uh, another method. So we're going to go through the different methods of detection here. Um, it's been purchased by Life Technologies now. Uh, Life Tech also owns the solid. Uh, it's uh, right now 100 base pairs or so. They, they believe they can get up to 400 base pairs. Short runtime. This is one of the new things in, in, uh, the, in the sequencing world was a, uh, instead of a 10-day run or a 5-day run. or uh, Actually, the 454 is fairly fast, but uh, not much data. 
but three hour runtime. Uh, came in different flavors. They spec at, usually these companies are being a little more conservative these days. They spec it at 10 megs. We usually get about 20 on ours and saying 100, we get 200. So they, they're specking a little low. 318, we have, don't have much experience with. They say a gig, maybe we'll get two. But how does that work? So it's a solid state sequencer. This is the, the flow cell from the pack bio. Um, it's a solid state sequencer, so uh, they keep saying that uh, they're leveraging the semiconductor industry, so they should be able to make them cheap, although they don't seem to lower their price, but anyway. Um, this is uh, what it looks like, and you'll see it coming around. There's a port where you can inject your, uh, and this again has little beads, you can inject your little beads. These little beads fall into these little holes, and each one of these holes, just think of it as a pH meter. So this is a whole array of, of uh, you know, million pH meters, and this is just the circuitry underneath. And the way that works, I always draw these cartoons as if it's a single molecule, but it's not. It's a, it is a amplified on a bead. The way it works is when a nucleotide is incorporated, a hydrogen ion is released. And so what it's measuring is a change in pH as the, the hydrogen ion is released. This is uh, another instrument where they flow one base at a time. So that's how they know what's being incorporated. So they flow T, you say signal at that pH meter, and then a T was incorporated. And again, it's, it's, uh, if you flow T, there's, there's nothing to stop more than one T to coming in. And here, in, in case, two T's came in, and they show it being nice and linear. But it's not real nice and linear, so it's a problem. This is some, some data uh, from an ion torrent, and you can see uh, in regions where there's homopolymer repeats here, it has trouble trying to decide how many there are. And this is its biggest weaknesses in homopolymer repeats. For substitutions, just straight substitutions, it actually does very, very well. In fact, it is slightly better than, than the, the MySeq. We'll talk about in a sec. So the MySeq is the, the baby HiSeq. The HiSeq is the big aluminum from do 700 gigs. The MySeq is a, a smaller version. Um, they, again, they spec it around one gig, we get around two. It's got an upgrade coming up later in the year. It should go up to around seven gigs. Uh, maybe we'll get even more than that. The nice thing about it is it's a uh, fast turnaround. Uh, it does onboard cluster generation. So to make those clusters in the, the HiSeq or the, the uh, Illumina genome analyzer that I showed you uh, is a separate instrument. So you put the, the slide in, you flow the DNA in and make the little clusters. This actually does it right on board. It also has onboard analysis, uh, which we don't use, but uh, if you want, it's sort of a, a complete genome center in a box. You put the, your reagents in, you, put your, you still have to make your library. You put your library in, uh, it makes the clusters, it runs, uh, and it'll do the analysis in, in about 30 hours. If you do it, it depends on your read length, but a full read length. And it does do a, a long read length, 150 base pairs. So the, the high seeks typically we run them at uh, 2 by 100. You can run them a little longer, but the MySeq does 2 by 150 quite well. And just to show you some of the data, so. This is the big brother, the, the HiSeq, which is sort of the industry standard. Uh, and this, uh, we got our first one in September of 2011. And what we, to test it out, whenever we get an instrument, we have to always kick the tires on them. Uh, what we did, we took a, a library. This is an exome sequencing project. So we had captured the exome uh, using the Agilent Sher Select system, which is about 50 megs of target. Uh, we had done it on a HiSeq with a 101 uh, read. Uh, There's just some of the metrics. We got lots of reads. And the, the nice thing was it had uh, reads per start point. So if your library is good, uh, you randomly sample the genome, and if you try not, you're hopefully not saturating that. So uh, you should have, uh, for every point in the genome, you should uh, have a read starting. But you don't want them piling up. You don't want 50 reads starting at the same point. At 125x coverage, and the target uh, at, at uh, that 50 meg, 8x, at 8x coverage, so more than 8 reads uh, at any one point, was 93% of it, which is not bad. So we took that same library, since it's the same chemistry, and sequenced it on a MySeq. And just to, to show you the MySeq data, the first thing you can look at is just the insert size. You expect that to be the same. It's the same library. You expect it to be the same. But this is showing that the cluster generation on board, it doesn't have any biases towards small fragments. So that was good. Um, we actually got more reads mapping. So the green part here is uh, what was on target for our exome that we captured. So we got more, and that's just because they're longer reads. Uh, indels by cycle. So I showed you the, the some data on the ion torrent and said that uh, homopolymer repeats for its weakness, and so those get uh, get uh, indicated as indels. Uh, and you can see that there's very few indels per cycle on the MySeq. So it does it does better on uh, especially on homopolymer repeats than the torrent. And the quality. This is the the interesting part. So this is the the quality. This is a Q30 value. Uh, so this is a, a one error in, in a thousand. And you can see that uh, on the on the high seek, some are as the cycles progress, the quality starts going down. This is just the the nature of the sequencing. As you start getting 
you've got this uh, cluster of molecules that are being extended, and some of them start getting out of phase. Uh, some don't get extended, and some actually get, get more than one base extended on them. So as they get out of phase, they create noise. And so the quality goes down the longer the read. Uh, you can see it starts dropping off around 90. And yet, say, this is the same library sequence on a MySeq, and you can see that it, even at 150 bases, it's above Q30, and it only starts falling off on the second read, uh, which is the, the opposite strand. So quality is quite good. On the horizon is the ion torrent. If uh, you've got lots of money, you could get early access to one now. Um, what it's, it's a big brother of the, uh, the, one, the, the giant uh, pH meter. They're promising a short run time. Uh, the first version that comes out, maybe 12 gigs of data. Uh, again, they're, they're usually conservative, uh, so that maybe we'll get more. Uh, we haven't actually ordered one of these. Uh, and then there's a, by the end of the year, I think they're saying they'll have a, another version, which is another chip, which will get 90 to 100 gigs out. And these guys, they, they said in February that by the end of the year, that you'll be able to do the $1,000 genome that everyone's talking about. I'm not sure. We'll see. Uh, also, on uh, Illumina's, uh, as soon as that was announced, uh, Illumina must have had uh, a press release ready. They have firing shots back and forth, right? Uh, this is, they announced the HiSeq 2500, which is an upgrade to the HiSeq 2000, or you can just buy it as a new instrument. Uh, it has an interesting uh, characteristic that you can run it in different modes. You can run it in the current high throughput mode, which is uh, 100 base pair reads, uh, 600 gigs. We usually get around 700 gigs. It takes 10 to 11 days to run. But you can also run in a rapid mode, more like the MySeq, where you can do the 2 by 150 and in around 27 to 40 hours, uh, and you do the cluster generation on board as well, uh, you can generate a whole genome in a day, essentially. Uh, and if you're running in the, in the high throughput mode, you have to use the CBOT, which is the device that uh, makes the, the flow cells for you. On, on your slides, I have an error. Can you cross that out? It, that is wrong. It's a, but it does cost more. It's 15% increase in the cost for 120 gigs of, of data. So they, they charge a little premium for that, that fast turnaround, is their plan anyway. Another one on the horizon is Oxford Nanopore. Um, they gave a talk in February at the AGBT meeting and uh, presented some data. It's, uh, there's different types of pores. There can be um, solid state pores, which are, are coming probably, but uh, difficult to sense, where you just have a, a tiny little hole in a substrate like this, and the DNA goes through. You've got some sensors, and as the DNA goes through, uh, you can measure a change in conductance. Their current version uses an actual uh, pore here, a, a biological pore. The DNA goes through, and as it goes through, it uh, the the bases that are sticking out they block this this pore, and you get a change in conductance. And it's actually reading about three nucleotides at a time, and it depending on the bulk essentially of those bases. Uh, you get a different change in conductance. Their error rate right now is probably around, I think, what they announced, 4%. Um, and the, the problem is that some of these th three nucleotides look the same. Uh, and so they, they, have a, a, they keep mutating this pore to try and get it more and more uh, discrimination. So until they get down, I think they want to get to 2%, they said, the error rate before they launch the, the whole thing. But it's pretty interesting uh, concept, interesting system. You can load these things up. This is just racks of these sequencers. Um, this is the large one because they call it the grid ion, uh, 101.5 gigs per hour. And you can just collect data for several days. The first version they're saying will have 2,000 of those little nanopores. And you just put your DNA in. There's no library preparation here. They put fragments of DNA in. They go through the holes. Uh, and you just keep collecting data until you get the coverage you want. And you can scale this like you can scale a computer and have rooms full of these things that you want. But the other cool thing is what they call the min ion, which is essentially a USB key, you know, fat USB key, but a USB key, which you could plug into virtually any laptop, more or less, uh, and has 500 of those nanopores, and you can get about a gig, and it lasts about a day, so you just keep collecting data for a gig. So that's pretty cool. Uh, like I said, right now it's about 96% accuracy or 4% error rate. And the other cool thing is you can get very long reads. I didn't mention about the, uh, the uh, PacBio, but the PacBio can get around 3 KB reads right now. But uh, the, you should be able to get very, very long reads. There's no limit, really. It's that, that fragment of DNA going through that pore. Uh, could be very long. In fact, hundreds of KB, potentially. And they have shown data where they've sequenced lambda, which is about 40 KB, in a single, single read going through. So if they can solve this accuracy problem, um, then uh, they'll be able to uh, sequence very, very long uh, fragments, which would be quite cool and uh, solve a lot of our problems. How much is 
they don't. It's not in the market yet. Yeah. Uh, I, I know what they're going to charge, but I can't say. But the, it's um, yeah, it's it's actually pretty reasonable. And the price will come down as they can get mass produce it. But it, you know, if it all works, it's pretty cool. Um, I envision some day where I can walk up to a podium, stick it stick it in the side of my computer, and stick some DNA and give a talk, and at the end show the sequence that was generated during the talk. So that'd be, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. But it's not in the market yet. They're they're probably do some early access uh, this year, I'm sure. But all I can say. Um, the thing I. I should mention the difference between this and the pack bio, and we'll talk about more a little later. Is the pack bio the errors that it has are somewhat random, and I'll get into why later. Uh, are pretty random, so by more coverage you can you can get over that error rate. Whereas these guys, the errors because you're you're measuring just back up here. Oops. You know you're measuring these three at the time, and if you have problems reading these three any one time, next time you, you read them you'll still have trouble. So even with coverage you still will have a, an error at that spot. So, uh, but they'll keep mutating as poor, and as they get discrimination, um, then uh, they should be eventually be able to discriminate methylated bases, et cetera. And the PAC bio can distinguish methylated bases more or less, too. All right, so the world has changed from the days of when the genome was done, where it's pretty one size fits all. Uh, AB was the dominant in the market, and uh, we all had the same machines, 3730s. Uh, just rooms full of them. It was linear, linearly scalable. You could just add more, more of them as long as you could feed them. Uh, but now there's a huge range of instruments to choose from with a couple new ones, a proton, the grid iron, uh, coming in. They all have different capacities. They all have different run times. Uh, and it really depends on what you want to do, which instrument is best for you. So there's a lot more decision rather than just uh, going and buying the, what's on the market. If you want to do large scale, then you probably want one of these. If you want to do things that are fast uh, and clinical, and then you're looking at these sorts of instruments, like this guy. Um, so it really, uh, uh, I think it's a tough decision. People ask me all the time, which one should I buy? And it's really the first question I have was, what do you want to do? Because it, it really is a tough decision. And to give you an idea of the scale, during the human genome, this is, uh, I was at WashU, uh, co-director of the Genome Center during the Human Genome Project with me there. Uh, Baylor College of Medicine, I'm somewhere in there. Uh, I went to for four years. And at the height of the Sanger sequencing, where we had rooms full of these things, uh, I think they're between these two centers probably had almost 200 uh, 3730s running. Do about, in a month, could do about 10 million reads or about uh, 5 billion bases. And just to give you an idea, a high seq will produce about 360 times that much data uh, a month, just a single high seq. So you can see that the, the, the reason for this course is you have to deal with all this data. And you can, like, literally, you know, by the end of the year, you'll sequence a, a genome in a, in a day, uh, whereas it took us seven years. The other thing is cost. Cost has been dropping dramatically. Uh, when the next gen started in 2005, it was still about $10 million to sequence a genome, still a bargain in those days. And it's been dropping every year. Uh, this year, uh, they, at least the, with the Proton, they're promising the $1,000 genome. Um, we'll see if they make it. But right now, it's probably about $5,000 to sequence a genome. But that's only, I want to stress, that's the reagents only. Whenever you hear all these things, the $1,000 genome, they, they talk about the $100 genome, um, they're really only talking about reagents, just the, the raw reagents. There's all these other costs, uh, a big one being informatics, what you'd be doing here. That costs huge. Uh, so maybe $5,000 to sequence the genome now, but I would say it's probably more like fifteen dollars to $20,000 by the time you're, you, you've done the entire genome and analyzed it. Uh, maintenance on the equipment, so um, a uh, high seq the maintenance is around $70,000 a year, so you have to amortize that over it. Uh, so there's all sorts of, even get the samples, uh, there's all sorts of those costs as well. So don't be fooled. And there's also, there's less pressure by these companies to uh, reduce their price now. Um, not only because there's competition, but, uh, you know, they're $5,000, people are sequencing, why, why go to 1000 right? So it'll go down, but I think they're starting to bottom out. All right, on to application. So, Whatever was done in genomics by any means has been pretty much been ported over to next gen. It doesn't mean that's the way you have to do it or even the best choice sometimes. But all the things that we did before, uh, especially with microarrays, has, uh, there's applications that you can do it on in next gen. This historical in 2008 was the first cancer genome relevant, relevant to this course. This was a uh, AML, so it's a blood tumor uh, where they could get lots of it and get it quite pure. This is done at WashU. They sequenced it on this. I go through these numbers because they're pretty typical for when you sequence a genome. Um, this was short read technology. It actually cost 
probably one and a half million dollars in those days. Uh, so a long way from the 5,000, but it was the first cancer genome. But here's what you find when you sequence any genome you compare to the reference, you'll find somewhere around two and a half million variants compared to the reference. They then felt they were interested in, um, in the, um, uh, the somatic variants, and so they, they filtered out uh, once they sequenced some skin, and so they, they took that as the normal and they sequenced all those out. You, you can compare it to dbSNP, you can compare it to 1,000 genomes, and you get rid of, on average, the high 90s, 96% of things have been seen before, and you're assuming that the somatic ones are going to be more rare than what you're interested in. They got rid of some by comparing to a few of the genomes that have been done at the time, and they also uh, only focused on novel SNVs, so these are things that uh, would, uh, eventually what they were interested in was encoding, because it's all we could really understand. They got rid of synonymous ones, figuring that they probably weren't important. That's not necessarily so. And got it down to what they, it was a handful that they could validate. Uh, remember, this was 2008. So they validated those. Most of them did not validate. So the, the SNV calling was quite poor. Uh, it's gotten better, as you'll see. And uh, they got down to eight validated um, SNVs. Uh, so they had 84% false positive rate in that first experiment. Still, it was pretty good. Uh, and they found these eight, val these, these are relatively simple tumors. They found eight acquired mutations, uh, some of which were known drivers, uh, like FLT3. <coughs> structural variants we'll be talking about tomorrow, so we won't talk much about it, but uh, structural variants you can, you can detect with these things. This is again in 2008, it was sort of the, the, the proof of principle. Um, you'll probably see a lot of circles plots this week. Uh, this is uh, the chromosomes rep represented around the outside, and then you can plot various things inside. Uh, these lines here are connecting where translocations have occurred. And uh, this was just a, a proof of principle. The other thing was, the more and more we look, that the, the normal genome, if there's such a thing, is uh, more and more structural variants. And in fact, uh, insertions, deletions, and things like that uh, occupy more bases than, than SNVs or SNVs, and uh, so the, the variation in the human genome is not only driven by SNPs, as we, we first thought when we sequenced the genome, uh, thought everyone was 99.99 the same, uh, but actually we're only thought 99.95 the same, which doesn't sound like, 0.4 doesn't sound like very much, but in a big genome it's a lot of bases. So there's more, a lot more variation in the normal humans than we expected. Uh, transcriptome analysis uh, as well, so it's a DNA to RNA, obviously, so microarrays were the first thing, um, and it the thing about microarrays is you're only looking at what you put down, so you have to decide what you're going to put on the microarray. Now they can hold a lot, so you can actually put down quite a bit. But in the microarray, you're only uh, interrogating, uh, you know, exactly what you put down, so you only be able to detect, like for example here, exons two and four. Uh, SAGE came out; that was a sequencing base, but only grabbed the ends. Uh, and TACMAN assays you can design to everything, but they're kind of arduous. But sequence, of course, can cover uh, the entire thing. Uh, and the other advantage with these paired end I didn't really talk much about paired end reads, talk more tomorrow about that. But you can sequence from both ends of the molecules, and so you can connect uh, between exons and understand how these things are spliced together. Also, in, uh, so it, the old way was you, you just, uh, you would label both two different colors and do it on a microarray. Uh, you can just grab the, the, the RNA and sequence it. The nice thing is it's a digital output, so basically the more data you collect, the more counts you get, and it has a much greater dynamic range than, uh, than microarrays. It doesn't saturate as well. You can saturate. You can saturate the library. Prepping them uh, isn't too bad. Um, let's put this slide up because uh, we'll talk about microRNAs. So you can uh, pull out the fraction of the small stuff, 18 to 30 nucleotides, and process that. Um, I don't have any slides on it, but I should mention that there are newer kits now that actually give you stranded information. So they, the reads that you generate on the sequencer match to the strand of the DNA that the transcript came from. That's really good for teasing apart overlapping sequences. And I, not everyone's doing that now, but more and more people are turning towards stranded sequence. Um, but from this, of course, other than like microarrays will give you a certain amount of information on expression. But from sequence, you can, uh, I'd say readily, but it's still difficult, uh, get not only the transcript profile, but differential splicing, differential allele expression. RNA editing, if you have the matched genome sequence. There were some papers that came out that said that RNA editing is rampant in the genome, and there's been lots of papers disputing that. Um, like the, I forgot what the numbers were. Well, Francis, you remember, it was like 10,000 RNA edits or something for transcriptome, but uh, most people think that they were just looking at errors. Uh, but there's still quite a bit of RNA editing going on. Uh, I've already mentioned the, this, and then the small molecule I've mentioned it. I'll give you an example. So this was in, uh, this came out in 2007. This was a, a paper that represented a ton of work, 
This is looking at microRNA expression atlas, so across various tissues. And they had done 330,000 330, small RNA sequences. It was done on old-fashioned sequencers. Had made 250 libraries, uh, traditional cloning and sequencing. Had done 1,300 clones from each library. It was a lot of work. Uh, 27, 26 different organs. And they had uh, seen about 700 microRNAs. And uh, cell line, uh, breast cancer cell line, MCF7, they'd seen about 100 of them. So this was uh, state-of-the-art in 2007. Um, so we decided we would try this just to, to uh, well, one of our earlier sequencers. So this is in 2000, and probably it was end of 2007 or maybe 2000, early 2008. So we did, we did a, a single run. It was the very first attempt we'd ever done on uh, uh, microRNAs. So in their paper, they had, had found uh, in MCF7, they did 795 reads. They found about 100 of them. Our very first run, we did 4.6 million reads uh, and found 213 of them. Um, if you look at uh, some of the differences, so there were some that uh, they found that we didn't find. Uh, they were very low abundance, and so you have to question whether they're real or not. This is their plot of the, the frequency of them. I had to actually scale this differently. Uh, but you can just see the sheer mag this gives you an idea of the sheer magnitude. And just to make sure that we were actually seeing what was correct here, um, this is we mapped them to the, their start points of these reads to the genome. Uh, this is the, f the height of this peak is the frequency of, of the mapping there. Uh, you turn on the track in the browser. I'm sure Francis will show you some examples of the browser today. Um, and you can see there is an annotated microRNA at that position. There's a major and a minor uh, fraction. So it's a major and a minor. Uh, that all made sense. The interesting thing is, is that um, you can see that they, they don't all start at the same point. Right? In fact, the one that's annotated in the database is this one right here. So this is not even the major. So this is the seems to be the major peak, at least in our data set. Uh, and a lot of people have seen this. And I don't know if it's been resolved yet whether that's just uh, biological noise. Does it really matter, or is it actually uh, uh, biologically significant? Epigenomics. I'll see much more on that. But uh, again, this was the traditional readout was microarrays, but you can actually then cross-link DNA to like histones. You can pull those down. Uh, and then release the DNA and sequence it so you can map things all over the genome. Um, I'm not going to say much about methylation, but there are ways of, of actually looking at methylation across the genome. And we're pulling down for chip seek, for example, then it just maps quite, quite nicely. The biggest uh, problem is you have to figure out what is significant, but these are clearly significant. Uh, well, we knew that from the experiment anyways. And you can see that there's a, a point of methylation here that's in one of the conditions and not in the other. So uh, nice data. All right. So Although that you get a lot of uh, sequencing power, um, changes the shifts the bottlenecks. So as we can do more and more sequence, uh, we have to prep more and more samples, perhaps. Or, of course, as you'll find out, uh, the analysis becomes more and more difficult to generate more and more data. So the, uh, the, the old way of doing it, if you want to sequence a region, it's just good old-fashioned PCR. You can sequence a whole region by having overlapping PCR fragments. Uh, we got good at doing uh, uh, amplicons that match the read length, or you could actually do five or ten kb amplicons and, and shear it up. If you want to do a gene, you just get the, all the exons, design primers, and uh, sequence that. So it was pretty straightforward. But it wasn't scalable. Um, as you started scaling up, and have to do you know, hundreds of thousands. We did, we scaled it up, uh, not with NextGen, but with Sanger at uh, Baylor. Uh, we were doing a half million PCRs a month and a million sequences, you know, one each in both directions. And that took a team about eight people and a lot of, a lot of robotics. But it wasn't, you know, you could sequence all of that now in one run on, a, on next gen. So clearly we had to scale up. So to capture regions, um, I, I will keep this title on here. This is old, but uh, in 1991, a colleague of mine, uh, we did uh, isolated cDNAs from specifically from chromosome 5. Uh, and that was by biotinylating back clones that represented the entire uh, chromosome and then uh, fishing out in cDNA library. So it really is... Really, they, they felt they invented something, but they just really pulled old technology for the most part. The main difference being is that um, in this, uh, some people call it genome partitioning or hybrid selection, you could actually now, in, in the technology that you could actually synthesize enough oligos, biotinylate oligos, to uh, pull these down. Started out on solid surface support, where this sequence here represents the, the sequence you want to capture. You have your sheared DNA or your library, uh, and you can then uh, anneal that, wash off everything that doesn't stick and elute that off and, and capture your region. It worked quite well. This is just one region we did. It was, uh, I think, 120 kilobases. I think it was 120 kilobases of region. All it says on here. No. Oh, 600 kb. There it is. 
Uh, and you can see you got pretty good coverage across the region. Where there's these bald spots is because they were repeat sequences, and uh, we weren't able to design a unique probe for that. And you can see the coverage wasn't bad, but you, it very clearly uh, mirrors the GC content of the probes. Uh, this is fairly old. It's still, you still see this sort of thing today, but it's uh, getting a little better. And uh, if you're doing uh, like uh, exon capture, so this is Agile Search, Sure Select, Map into the Genome, you can see it's quite specific that you get good capture uh, if you set your threshold, very good capture just on the, the exons and not in between. So the other thing is um, multiplex PCR. Uh, if you ever tried, tried multiplexing PCR, you can have 10 sets of primers that work really beautifully. You put them all in one tube, and you get a gazillion different junk products. Uh, it takes a long time to optimize. So Raindance came out with a method that was using little droplets. So this is sort of an emulsion PCR, only the microfluidics produces them uh, when you need them. So you synthesize the oligos, you put them in little droplets, and then you can mix them all together. And this is a library, then, of uh, primers. Um, you can then take that in your DNA and on their little device, you can merge these droplets so right around here. The little pulse of electricity merges the two droplets. You now have, supposedly, hopefully, have a piece of DNA, and one of these primer pairs fuse the droplet. It just spits them out in a tube, and then you, you do PCR in that. And it's like you get uh, you know millions of PCR. It's like doing millions of PCR tubes in each one of these droplets, um, but they don't interfere with each other now because they're separated, and so you get pretty good amplification. Uh, it's it started out to be quite expensive, and so we didn't use it much, but we're looking at it again as prices come down. Uh, they now have a, this is fairly new, they came out with a hotspot target, if you're interested in cancer genes, there's 42 genes, uh, 71 KB of total, uh, around 200 base pair amplicons. So if you're working out at FFPE samples, it's important to keep the amplicons short. Uh, and so this works quite well out of FFPE. Uh, and then we, we recently did a run on that, and you can see the coverage here, this is 100x coverage. Uh, at 100x coverage, you're in the high 90s for the, the target that's being covered. And you do want to go deep on that. So it works quite well. It's quite reproducible. This is different samples. Another one is the Haloplex. Um, this has been bought by, everyone gets bought. This has been bought by uh, Agilent, um, but it's still market, marketed as the Haloplex. This one's a little different. It's, um, you take the DNA and you do a, a multi-restriction digest of it, and then you put in an adapter which has uh, overhangs to the part you want to capture. So the one limitation is it is a restriction enzyme-based uh, process. And because of that, then, uh, depending where the restriction sites are, you can get different coverages. But it works quite well. They use uh, about eight different enzymes to, to get around that. Um, and then you amplify the part you want and sequence it. Just to give you an idea of the scale, we, we were looking at 19 genes, which I'll talk about later, 61 KB of target. We did it with this. Uh, and on the MySeq, you could very readily put 10 samples together. You could probably do more, but we wanted deep coverage. Uh, so we get about 1.9 gigs of raw data and 97% uh, of the mapped reads were on target. So it worked quite well. It's a fairly simple process. It takes a reasonable amount of input DNA. I think their protocol asks for about a microgram of DNA, but we brought it with 100 nanograms. It works just fine. This was their design. Because of the restriction-based, um, because they're, they're limited restriction sites, and they did this based on a high seq run, which is 100 base pairs, this was the coverage that they felt they could get. The advantage of the MySeq being the longer it reads is we could actually read further into those restriction fragments. So we got over 99% coverage of the target. So it worked quite well. Uh, this is a, another Haloplex run um, just showing. This is a custom one that we had them do. Lots of good coverage, very reproducible. Uh, this one, one line here is actually mouse. And you know, we'll talk about that in a minute, but that was, that was mouse. Uh, we want to see this is what it should look like. We didn't want to get captured from mouse product. Uh, the uh, ion torrent comes, has a AmpliSeq, which is their version of it. This is a uh, multiplex. It's uh, PCR with some tricks. It's all pretty much in one tube. I haven't made any effort here to normalize the scale because I, I want you to see the difference here. So the blue one is the FFPE, and the red one is, is uh, DNA from blood. And you can see that this, this is all the 800 amplicons they've got in there plotted by their coverage. And you see it's, there's a lot of variability, but it's reproducible, so it's obviously the efficiency of the primers. Um, they have a new version now, which is better, that uh, flattens this out. But this is the type of stuff you have to deal with in uh, varying coverage of you know, any of these multiplex uh, methods. All right, I'm going to move on here. Uh, challenges in cancer genome sequencing. So start with the normal genome, you end up with the cancer genome. A lot of things happen in between. You get uh, drivers going, um, which eventually give an advantage to growth. But more and more things accumulate. So what you end up with in the end 
is not a single population of molecules, but uh, a population of, uh, you know, a population of uh, varying uh, clonal uh, modalities, uh, which both in copy number and in uh, point mutations. In a cancer genome project, typically, because of this, we need large numbers. Uh, it looks you take an individual with the cancer, you sequence them, you sequence their blood, you get the difference between them, you get a bunch of somatic variants, uh, you collect enough people, you map them onto pathways, and hopefully you'll find out uh, what is the drivers behind this cancer. So it's the basic uh, premise. Uh, the International Cancer Genome Consortium had a meeting here in, uh, in Toronto in October 2007. There are 22 countries, 120 participants. The idea was to ask the question, um, you know, could the world start working together instead of competing uh, continuously on uh, cancer genomics? Uh, typical thing for any meeting was the uh, answer was yes, but uh, usually nothing happens, but this one actually got some traction. The reason for it, not only is the scope huge and it's an important uh, disease to conquer worldwide, but what got me excited was the standardization here. If we could standardize the, how we present the data and how we uh, uh, measure the quality of the data, we could compare across cancer types quite readily. Um, there's a lot of projects out there and you can download the data from one, download the data from another, and it's really hard to, to compare those data sets. They're very, very different. Uh, so like I said, so there was a paper that came out to describe it. Um, the goal was to do 50 tumor types or subtypes, uh, and the goal is to do 500 tumors of each, so, so 500 tumors of each subtype plus their controls. And this is like doing 50,000 human genome projects, so it's a huge scale. Lots of countries involved. This is from earlier in the year. Uh, all the projects, all the countries. Um, I will point out us here doing pancreatic. Australia is also doing pancreatic. Uh, we work very closely with them. But right now, this is actually out of date, but at the time of this slide, there were 18,000 tumors committed to be sequenced. So huge amounts of data coming. There's a web portal for the ICGC. There's also uh, where you can get the data. I don't know if Francis, if we're going to cover more. Yeah, Francis will cover more of this. So just give me the URL. And then just to talk about us a little bit and our projects. Uh, we're a Translational Cancer Research Institute. Uh, we have an annual budget of about 160 million. There's, this is the building up the street. This building's under construction. It's about that high, I think, right now. Um, this is where we are currently, in three floors of this. Uh, and uh, there's about 300 people in the here, but the entire program covers about 1,500 people. The OICR acts a little bit, acts a little bit like a um, funding agency. So we support other programs externally, including cancer stem cells, for example. I'm going to talk about cancer genomics a little bit, bioinformatics, and uh, the high-impact clinical trials and how we interact. But we have everything from prevention all the way through to clinical trials. This is our platform. We have 10 HiSeqs, two MySeqs, a PGM, and a PacBio, and a fairly significant compute infrastructure, but it's never enough. Uh, this is always full. Uh, these are always maxed out. Um, but in that new building, we're going to hopefully get some more, and I guarantee this will always be full, and these will always be maxed out. <laughs> you never can have too much. So uh, one of our main targets is pancreatic cancer. It's a pretty dismal disease, five-year survival rate of 2%. Uh, it's only one in 50 new cases, so it's not the most common, but because of the survival rate, it accounts for 6% of uh, cancer deaths. One of the reasons is when people uh, arrive at the clinic, it's very hard to diagnose. They, don't, they sometimes don't have very specific uh, symptoms. Only 15% are surgically resectable, and, and they usually uh, succumb within two years. Most people, when they show up, already have metastatic disease and can be a very short time of survival. So if we're going to start a project, uh, like I said, a normal ICGC project would be 500 samples. We've scaled back. It's actually 375, not 250, but uh, that's because Australia is also collecting. Uh, and so between us, we'll have over 700. Uh, because uh, we, need to, we want to uh, deal with consent uh, for the ICGC, we couldn't really go back to the old samples. We had to go to new samples. Uh, and so we teamed up with various centers to help us collect these samples. Uh, so sample acquisition in many of these projects is one of the rate limiting steps. Typical project was we would uh, get germline DNA. It's usually blood. Sometimes it's adjacent tissue. The tumor, we'd measure these various things uh, that we've talked about. Uh, do some validation, magic happens like you're going to learn to do here, and hopefully we'll, we'll find some pathways. So some of the issues with primary tumors, uh, the very first one I showed you was uh, a leukemia uh, that was sequenced. You can get lots of uh, pure tumor in leukemia. They're great to work with. Uh, we unfortunately picked ones that are hard to work with. Pancreatic tumors are uh, cellularities from 20 to 80 percent. Uh, 
most of them are below 30%. So 70% of it is not tumor, right, when we get these samples. And also the heterogeneity I talked about uh, compounds the problem. And so if you just, uh, I won't go through all these numbers because they're easy to work out on your own, but even if there's no copy number changes in toity, then the genome is still 2N. But in many of the tumors that we have are only 20% tumor, and so a heterozygous uh, mutation, somatic mutation, the si number of reads that we, or the signal is only 10%, right? So uh, you run into a problem very quickly, and this is, this is actually a pancreatic tumor. You can see the, the tumor part and lots of stroma. So one of the goals of the ICGC is to have a 95% uh, verification rate. A goal which I think is actually too high. I don't think that's even possible. Uh, most tumor types are one, around one somatic mutation per megabase, so we'd have to have an error rate of less than 0.05 to achieve this. And uh, as you'll see as we go through this, this, this week, uh, that's very going to be very difficult to achieve. Uh, it's a false positive, false negative uh, trade-off, but we're around 85%, and I'm pretty happy with that. I don't think we'll achieve that. Uh, we'll talk tomorrow about one of the, the main errors that we have is uh, misalignment. So even the aligners still make mistakes, uh, and uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow. The other thing is that one of our big sources of error is just coverage. So if you're looking for somatic variants, it's in the tumor, it's not in the normal. Uh, and if you don't call it normal because of either insufficient coverage or for whatever reason, then it looks like a, a, a somatic. So we're getting better at this. We have to make sure we have good coverage. There are many ways you can try and, and get around these problems. So if this is back to that pancreatic tumor, you can see this region here has more tumor in it than, let's say, here. So you can actually core it out. Uh, that works. Uh, it, but in pancreatic, unfortunately, most of the tumors are pretty uniform. No matter where you core it, you get more or less the same. You get a 10 or 15 percent increase, which is good, but not good enough. So we also have a component in our project for doing xenografts. So part of the tissue is, is implanted in mice uh, and grown up. The tumor grows up there. And from that, we can also try and make cell lines, same analysis. So why are we using the xenografts? One is the low cellularity. So they're, they're great in your project if you have this problem. Um, the idea was we grow up more tumor. Um, so increase the amount of material we have to work with. They also are great preclinical models. Uh, so if, you, if we sequence that tumor and find a pathway that is critical to that, that tumor, then uh, we can actually target it in that mouse. Uh, so we have a bank of these, and we can target different pathways. And in, in the OICR, we have two groups that are uh, looking at that sort of thing. So we're trying to generate reagents for them as well. It just shows that it works. This is that same tumor. Uh, implanted in the mouse, you can see the xenograft has a lot more tumor content in it. Yeah, that can happen, but it, they're pretty, they're reasonably true. Um, but they, the, the frequencies will change. I don't know if I got slides on that. The frequencies will definitely change. Um, but uh, some of them, it's the only way to work with. Them. So just from a detection standpoint. Um, Almost universally, uh, pancreatic tumors have a KRAS mutation. And so you can look for that. And this is just showing that in the xenografts, we're able to detect the, the KRAS mutation universally in the cell lines. Uh, in the primary tumors, with the, especially the low cellularity samples, we couldn't detect it in some of them. Uh, at least our pipeline didn't detect them. If you go back and look, uh, for example, there were two reads out of 38 here that supported the KRAS mutation that was in the xenograft. Here's three out of 227. This is incredibly low cellularity. This is about 3% cellularity of this sample. Uh, and et cetera. So it's very difficult to call in those primary tumors unless you know what you're looking for. So the xenografts were helpful there. So one of the things you can do with the xenografts is uh, sequence the xenograft, find all the variants, and then go back to the primary tu tumor, do very deep sequencing to make sure that they didn't arise or, or what the subpopulation. And I'll talk about the, the heterogeneity in a second. How long do I have? Schedule okay. fit. Yeah, I've got till 1030 or something, right? All right, no problem. Oh, we got lots of time. Lots of time. So, some of the, the disadvantages of, of the uh, xenografts, as we just heard, that you you are clearly working with a tumor that went through a mouse. Uh, it's like when we sequenced the human genome, we were looking at the human genome from a bacterial view. Every clone that was grown came up in, in a bacteria. Uh, and so, some things didn't grow in bacteria, so we had gaps because of that. Uh, but So we did some very deep sequencing in the early ones, very, very deep. But the percent sequence of the line to human was relatively low. Usually we're in the high 90s. Uh, and so like this one here, only 30% of the sequence we generate actually aligned to the human genome. 
if you measure the amount of mouse that's in there either by qPCR or estimate it from the sequence, you can see that uh, the, the amount of mouse can vary in this one, in fact, is 71% of it of the tumor was still mouse, right? So the uh, pancreatic tumors like, don't like to grow in a little ball of, of tumor cells. They like to grow interdigitated with the surrounding stroma. And what they did was, that although there was a lot more tumor there, uh, it had recruited a lot of mouse tissue. There's also infiltration going on. Uh, so uh, we still ended up with a, a lot of mouse DNA. So, you know, did we really trade one problem for another? Instead of having the, the human cancer stroma problem, we have a, a mouse stroma problem there. And why is that important? You think you just filtered out informatically, and, and some of it you can, as you'll see. But this is a, a series of reads aligned to the genome. Uh, it's hard to see at the back there, but uh, there's the G's here, the variants. It's a quite clean sequence. You can see a few sequence errors. Uh, but you would clearly call that as a variant uh, T to G. Uh, and this would be a somatic variant, it's not in the normal. If you take that region, the 100, sort of 100 bases surrounding that, that uh, variant, and you uh, blad it back to the, mouse, the human genome and the mouse genome, the only difference you see is in that 100 base stretch is that one base. So all that is, it looks like a beautiful uh, somatic variant, but it's actually a, a mouse. Uh, mouse reads aligning to the human genome, and the only difference being that one variant. So it, it's, it looks and smells like a somatic uh, variant, but it's not. So what do we have to do? Again, I found myself sequencing mouse. We have to sequence the mouse genome. It's relatively easy now compared to when we did it the first time. Um, so we were able to generate very quickly, generate high coverage of the mouse genomes. Uh, we did each of the ones. We have to do another one now. We did these. The two groups we're working with use different backgrounds for their mice, so we had to sequence each one of those. Uh, and it's got actually two more variants we're going to have to sequence now. But it's easy to do. Uh, if you look at what aligns, around 1% or so of the mouse reads will align to the human genome at the, the pipeline that we run. They disproportionately, as you'd expect, align to the exome. So about 25%. Uh, the you know, exome is only 1% of the genome, but about 25% of these reads that are aligning actually align to uh, the exome. And if you then just run it through your pipeline, so you align the mouse genome, run it through our, our pipeline and call variants, you get a lot of variants that are called, and again, disproportionately in the exome. Now, uh, there's another circles plot, so these are the human chromosomes. This inner ring here shows all the SNPs that are called uh, from the xenograft. And then if we, sub after sequencing the genome, if we remove all the SNPs that we found by doing that, you can see most of the ones that are still here are actually mouse. Uh, and we still see some mouse ones that we're, we can't. You think it'd be really easy informatically, but it's not. And that's, again, back to the alignment issues we'll talk about more tomorrow. You can actually use the xenografts to, uh, to enrich as well. So you can either pull out the mouse uh, cells, or you can select for the human cells. We don't like doing this because this is saying that the, the human cells, the human cancer cells, will express the markers that, that from their tissue of origin, which they may not, and actually shown they don't always. And so you might lose some here. But the mouse background should be the same. You should be able to do this, and it works. The problem with this is um, it actually works on frozen, but works better on fresh. But you have to dissociate the tissue and then incubate it with these antibodies. So this, you know, this thing's been at 37 degrees for a couple hours by the time this is all done. So I think RNA expression is going to be out the window. Uh, you're probably wondering why not just do LCM. Uh, we are starting to do that now. Uh, we just got a new system in. Uh, we spent a, a good part of the past year, though, uh, you don't get a lot of material when you do LCM. So we spent a good part of the last year working on protocols to use less and less input material to still get comprehensive coverage. So we're just to the point where we can start marrying LCM along with um, oh, so, um, laser capture microscopy. So we just uh, go in and you can actually now use the microscope, mark it up, and actually pull out the tumor part or pull out the stroma. We're very interested in the stroma uh, tumor interactions. But you don't get a lot of material for doing RNA-seq or for genomic sequencing. Um, so, but we, I think we're almost there. I think within a few months we'll be able to do that. It's really important for us for pancreatic because we don't sequence anything. Those early ones I showed you were ones we just tried, but we don't really sequence anything that's less than 20% cellularity, which is at least half, if not more than half, of our samples are less than 20%. Sorry? How much material do you use? So to make a library? We routinely make library, like a, the genomic library, and do whole genome sequencing on 100 nanograms. Uh, that works well. Uh, we've done it on 10. You can do 10, but the representation and the biases in the genome start to pick up. Uh, you can do 50 probably pretty well, but we routinely do 100. The protocols call for about a microgram of input. And we started out three years ago with 10 micrograms of input. So we, it's come a long way. It's still going to be hard to get 100 nanograms of material. Uh, 
Um, but uh, I think we're reaching, if we can get down to 10 nanograms, then it's quite doable. But that, that's about the only way we're going to be able to rescue about half our samples, or we're going to have to collect twice as many samples. But we're also interested in, are the low cellularity ones different than the high cellularity? cellularity one. We, you know, we're already biasing our sample set because we're only currently looking at things that are surgically resected, so that 15%. And then we're also biasing because we're only looking at things over 20% cellularity. So uh, there's no guarantee that what we find will be applicable to the rest of the pancreatic cancer. Um, won't get into a lot of details, but this is a typical for any of these projects that this is the first 71 that we looked at. There are 100 genes that are mutated in three or more of the samples, and then there are 1,000 more genes that are mutated in one or two of the samples. And it's this long tail that you see in all of the cancer projects these days. There's some main drivers. Here's KRAS. Um, and it, these are a lot of primary ones. And so you can see, actually, it should be, you know, 95% of them have KRAS. But it, obviously, it's, uh, we missed some. Uh, but this, sort of the known players are here. These are ones that are interesting. And then this huge tail. And uh, we'll be talking about pathway analysis, and that helps with sort of the They're more homogeneous. Now, if you did look at different parts, you might find different things. Yeah, and, and there's some. There's a paper not too long ago, two months ago. Yeah, probably, and it was in prostate samples that the paper came out and saying where they biopsy, you got very different prognostic information out of it. But you know, more work. <laughs> uh, put this up for validation. So these are Sanger traces. I mean, some people have never seen one. I don't know. Uh, this is what we did with the human genome, but here you can very easily see that there are, are uh, two alleles here. And so when we're sequencing, uh, in the old days, we'd find something, we'd have to go in and check. So this would be, for example, this would be the tumor, this is the normal. Uh, you can clearly see that uh, there's a variant here, there's an AT here, and only an A in the normal. So that, that's just for remind me about validation. And so validation now becomes more and more problematic because you start finding more and more things. So you sequence a, a, a tumor and you find several thousand things, and you have to validate them. One thing we do do is we do a, a SNP array on everything. Uh, and this is then, we look at the concordance here. So if you do a SNP array, then the sequence, you can look in the, in the sequence and see that uh, you can see those SNPs that the array picked up. The arrays aren't perfect, so you should, you should probably plateau. This is actually, you know, 99% uh, of them should be validated or more. Uh, so here you're 90, close to 99, 98%. So that tells you that your sequence depth is good, that your pipeline's working well. This is just a select set that we picked out of here, some that we wanted to validate uh, using Sanger. We tried it with a Sanger-based approach, and you can see then, then using the PacBio, which I'll talk about more in a minute, um, you can see you could validate more of them. And this is just that, that whole idea of just being able to detect here on a Sanger read. Unless, once you get below about 20% cellularity, this little bump here is, is usually not enough to confirm it. This is a pretty good trace here. But you can see here's, here's an example here. You know, your background pump here is like 10%, so you couldn't detect, you couldn't be sure that that's real or not. And this is just some data from a more recent validation. So pipelines are always evolving. This is our old informatics pipeline, our new informatics pipeline. This is cellularity of the samples based on KRAS sequencing. Uh, and so you can see that uh, the, their average, or the, the ones we work with are typically 30 40%. Many of them below 20%. Early on, we sequenced them anyways just to see how we could do. Um, you can see that the, the validation rates are quite poor, although some, are, some of them aren't bad. So here's 16%, and we have 96% validation. I took this one out and calculated this number because we knew there was a problem with this one. Um, so about 85% is where we kind of sit in our validation rate, which isn't bad. It's not the 95% they keep saying that we have to get to, but I don't think you can do much better than that. The heterogeneity, we talked a little bit about it. So as a um, tumor is initiated and proliferates, you get different clonal varieties. It's uh, exacerbated when uh, in therapy. So you, you put a, a drug in the patient, and you'll kill off some of the clones, but some will survive or adapt. And, and when you get uh, uh, a recurrence, you get these resistant clones emerging. So you get, you'll, you'll sort of select a subpopulation or potentially a new population with a new mutation. But usually you're selecting a subpopulation. There's a paper that I've included in, in your handout that came out recently. This is the, the Walter et al. Uh, from WashU. Again, this is leukemias. Um, they're just nice examples because they're clean. You don't have to deal with all the, the background normal. Um, and they can clearly see that if you cluster the allele frequency, so this is in the myo, myo, myoplastic disorder uh, or syndrome, um, 
this was the the early cancer that they had or the early syndrome, and then it, in secondary AML that occurred, and you're plotting the, the mutations and their frequencies, and you can start seeing clusters. So this is one subpopulation of clones, another, 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 and another that have grown up. And they uh, they do some nice figures here. Apparently, that's some, there's they have one person there who's very good at Photoshop. Unfortunately, this isn't a program to generate these. Someone actually draws these. Uh, but this is, uh, they're trying to figure out now the clonal evolution, and this is one interpretation of that. So the yellow cluster here is the original clone that uh, accounts for a great percentage. Like here, it's 74% uh, of the clones is in, bracketed by this yellow. But it started to accumulate mutations and uh, getting more and more subtypes. So it's breaking into subtypes. Some of these subtypes die off, uh, either through treatment or, or just the other ones outgrow it. Um, so we've talked a bit about this, but the trends from 2005 to 2010 was bigger and cheaper, so they tried to do more reads uh, at less cost, longer reads, etc. cetera. Uh, there's kind of a war going on. Uh, Lumina, I think, was clearly the winner with the high seek. Solid went through many versions, so the machines were con continuously changing, the data were changing. But around 2011 and, and this year, more machines have come up, but there's also, even within these companies, are, are developing new machines that have more moderate throughput and faster runtime. Uh, these are some of the examples, the, the ion torrent, and aluminum IC, and potentially the Oxford Danapore when it comes out. Um, there's still heavy guns being developed, uh, the, especially, you know, the 2500 coming out. But this, this here, they're obviously targeting a niche for clinical applications. So we'll talk a little bit about clinical applications. So that changes the workflow. On the research side, tumor normal care, we don't care if it takes a couple months in general. Uh, we, there are continuously things flowing through the pipeline, but on the clinical side, you do care about time. Uh, you want to be able to do that sequencing, certainly in less than a week, as you'll see. When I came to Toronto, there were lots of questions uh, that I had for the clinicians. Clinicians had lots of questions for me. Hang on a second, let me check. Okay. Um, I talked about this. So, so this is a collaboration between Genome Technologies, the bioinformatic group headed by Lincoln Stein, and uh, High Impact Clinical Trials headed by Janet Dancy. And another point about the OICR, so I showed you that this nice uh, artist illustration of the building. This was under construction. Uh, at this point, it was just a hole in the ground. But look at our location here. We're very close to our funding agency, which, uh, the Ontario government, which is good and bad. Um, the University of Toronto is across the way here. But we're also adjacent to uh, major hospitals in Toronto. And the one in particular I'll talk about is Princess Margaret Hospital is part of the University Health Network, which is Toronto General, Princess Margaret, and Western way over here. Um, but this is an oncology hospital. This is cancer hospital only. And we work very closely with them. We've been uh, working very closely with them on a, a clinical application for genomics. So the questions were, were thus, is, you know, is the technology ready? When I first came here in 2007, started talking about it, and they'd asked me that question, and the real answer was no. Um, it's not. The turnaround was too long. Uh, and it would just take the, the effort to do it. It wasn't worth the, uh, starting the project. Uh, the other one was, do we have enough targeted agents? That's my question to them. Is it really worth doing? If we did sequence uh, targeted sequencing of genes. Would, would it make a difference in the therapeutic uh, outcome? And this is just a partial list of some of the, the targets that there are, some of the genes that are targeted, uh, some of the known mutations that are targetable, uh, and what tumors they're in. But the, the concept was really that, for example, here, BRAF mutations uh, are quite uh, prevalent in melanomas, and there is a BRAF inhibitor. And the idea was, well, if we see the BRAF mutations in other cancers, can we also use that BRAF inhibitor with success? This is a, both a good and bad example in that uh, in uh, colon cancer, if, with a BRAF mutation, if it hit with BRAF uh, uh, inhibitor, you actually don't kill the cells. And it's because they can escape the pathway because they express EGFR and uh, the melanomas do not. But if you also block the EGFR, then you can't kill them. So understanding the molecular landscape of the tumor you can actually target the therapy, and this is the idea behind personalized medicine and cancer. Um, big one was, can we use FFP? Uh, because that's the currency of, of uh, pathology uh, instead of fresh. We did get some fresh biopsies collected and didn't see much difference between our ability to analyze them. Formalin fixed paraffin embedded. So pathologists, what was a pathologist here? Right? <laughs> pathologists love to destroy DNA. <laughs> right? So they... They take a biopsy, and the first thing they do, and I understand why, <laughs> they drop it into formalin. Uh, formalin is not kind to DNA and RNA. Uh, and then they put it in paraffin. And that's, you know, then they, then they can take a slice, and they can stain it, and they can look at it. 
um, and uh, they get the morphology that they can do a diagnosis on, and that's rooted in 50 years of pathology, right? 130 years of pathology. So uh, obviously, the you know the diagnosis is key. Uh, so we had hoped to use that, that we could also collect a fresh tumor bi biopsy, and so we did an experiment. Usually, they they were pulling three biopsies. The first one goes into formalin. <laughs> the second one usually went into formalin because in case the first one didn't work or didn't contain tumor, and sometimes they'd save the third one. Um, we actually found that the we got better results out of the FFB than the fresh, and I think it was partly because I'm not sure how long it sat around before it got properly frozen. Um, but it was clear to us that. Uh, this is the currency of pathology, so we had to, to work in that. So we just finally said, forget fresh, don't bother even trying to get it for us. We'll, we'll learn to work with this. And so that's what we've been doing. Uh, this is, and what key thing, what is the difference between primary and metastatic sites? So I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, we were biopsying, as you'll see in this, this uh, pilot phase, uh, metastatic tumors, and then you're treating the patient on it. But it is important to, to know uh, the primary tumors available, usually, in some FFB block. You know, this is expensive. and is there much difference between these two that you could just uh, you could sequence the primary and treat based on that? You'll see that's what came out of that. So back to the PAC bio. We started this quite a while ago. Um, and you'll see that you know, PAC bio may not be the, the clinical instrument in the future, and I'd say it isn't the clinical instrument, uh, but we had it. And the thing about it was a fast turnaround instrument. Uh, it had about an hour to generate sequence, and uh, the library prep's quite easy. We had run, we've had, we'd run quite a few smart cells, that little thing that went around. Um, it's called a smart cell. Uh, right now, I think we're actually over about 1,200. And most of them we've done on the clinical sequencing part of it, just for that fast turnaround. Just to give you an idea of what happens when you get a new instrument in, we got the, the second commercial uh, instrument, early access. Uh, that came in July 2010. Um, and, they, you know, it got installed, and the, the specs were met. Uh, and so we, we started working on it, but we continuously work with it, trying to improve it. And these are various things that happen. Here's an example: they they came out with a new enzyme, so they're always trying new enzymes. Got an increase in read length and throughput. They did an instrument upgrade, got a decrease in read length, decrease in throughput, um, more tweaks. Finally, got that uh, to uh, work, and we improved the quality of our DNA. Kept going up. Um, and when we another instrument upgrade, this one actually worked. Uh, we got better stuff, and so you're continuously. This is a, over a, what about a year. Um, another chemistry upgrade, uh, so there's a lot of pain to get a new instrument in, but uh, it's working quite well for us now. And we are ready, come on, there we go, uh, ready to start sequencing. This is sort of a, a, a typical run metric that we get. Error rate here, uh, or accuracy, I shouldn't say error rate, I should give them the benefit of the doubt. The accuracy is 86%, which means the error rate is 14 sounds horrendous. If you're doing clinical sequencing, then how could that ever work? And I'll, I'll show you how we did it. Um, the read, link, read, uh, read length is around 3 kb, so it is a long read instrument if you're interested in long reads. Not a lot of them, though. Um, number of reads, so about 70,000 reads. Right? So, so it's sort of a moderate, it's very moderate throughput. If you think about it, I'll talk about circular consensus in a second, but if you want to sequence something around 600 base pairs, you can get, think about like Sanger reads, which are sort of the gold standard. You can get 70,000 of these Sanger reads for about, you know, Sanger-like reads for about 300 bucks. So depending on your project, like for microbes and stuff, it's actually quite good. Circular consensus. So what we decided to do was uh, very early on, this was the only really fast turnaround instrument. This is before MySeq, before IM Torrent. Um, if we amplify our, our targets of interest in PCR products, you can then put on a hairpin adapter, which essentially then makes a close uh, circle of single-stranded DNA. In that well I showed you the slide on the pack bio with the polymers at the bottom, it can read around that template multiple times. Right? So if we keep this short, and our amplicons, because we're working in FFB, we have to keep them short because the DNA has been, it's fragmented. Uh, so our, our amplicons are less than 300 base pairs. The polymerase can go around multiple times. Remember, it's got 3 kb reads. So on average, it's going to go around 10 times or so, right? Uh, it makes one single sequence that comes off in your in the computer. Um, this 3 kb read, but then you can clip out these reads and build a consensus. And so what it does is it reads through like the forward strand, reverse strand, for, you know, through the adapter, through the adapter, and the next one. And so you, by looking at these adapters, you can clip it up and get a consensus. When you do that, you get a much more accurate sequence. Remember I said the, the errors are, are pretty random here. This is just our pipeline won't go through that much. We had to build our own. But this is what the data would look like. So this is if you take all the reads that come out. So even things that didn't go around more than once, right, because it's a it's a distribution of these read lengths. 
This is what the raw data kind of looks like. So here's a variant. Uh, you, can, you can see it, but you can see this background here. These little purple squiggles, those are in, insertions, so there's extra bases in there. These are deletions, uh, and these are, are substitutions. So these are all errors in this sequence here. If you restrict yourself to three or more or five or more, it cleans it up. You can still see that the dominant error is insertions. And this is a, sort of a homopolymer repeat issue where there's multiple multiple T's and, and it thought there were four instead of three, for example, this sort of thing. Um, uh, these are still some deletions, which are usually dark bases. So a nucleotide was incorporated that did not have a floor on it. Uh, and so there's no signal. So it looks like a deletion. But you can clearly see uh, your variant that you want to call. Yeah. Uh, when did the series begin? Did you see all that? That's something then that you have to decide on your experiment. So um, what, what you can do is you can plot the variance uh, across your entire amplicon. So, you know, for here there's a C, so you'd only see it once, right? Uh, and then you'll see this will be a big peak, and then you have to set that threshold. We're pretty comfortable calling with these data down to around, we, we set a threshold at 5%. So if we don't see it in 5% of the reads, you know, 5% or greater, we'll, we'll call it, and that turns out to be real. We can actually probably go down to around 2%, 3%. But uh, that's when you start getting more and more noise. So you, empirically, you, you have to take some knowns. I think I have that here. Uh, and decide where that threshold is. Yeah, I have it coming up. Sir, could you, for that variant, why, what are the reasons that that variant is not present in all of these? Oh, because uh, this is, uh, uh, some of these are normal. So it's a, it's a tumor. So there's the, it's heterozygous. So there are, it should be 50-50. But it's not because of. Well, it's not partly because of uh, cellularity. So in the sample we get, it's not all tumor. There is some normal adjacent tissue. So that, that also decreases the number of reads as well. And there, there are some reads, there are probably some errors where, it, but it'd be rare, but there are probably a few where it, the error happened to be the right one, but that's probably true. That also means you're going to miss that are present in less than 5% of the tumor. Yeah. Yeah, we're not, we, we set our cutoff at 5%, so if it's less than 5%, we, we, we will ignore it. But the yeah. other reason is, is that it could be actually from a tumor that caused the variance. Yeah. Because it's more common to mutation. Yeah, yeah. So it may not, it may be somewhere else you may see that it's 50-50, it's and then this one it's, it's only 10%. There's at least three different reasons why. Yeah, yeah. And they're all important. <laughs> you have to think about them all the time. So it, we so it, I'll get into it, but this is a uh, we're doing clinical sequencing, but we're not a CLIA lab, right? So we're a research lab. So this would this would not be used in the clinical report because we're not allowed to do that. The CLIA lab would verify this. Now they like to use Sanger read to verify. That's the gold standard in their opinion. Problem is, I told you when you do a Sanger read, if it's below like twenty percent, you probably can't. You know, you can sort of you know it's there, so you see the bump. You go, yeah, it's there. But the, you know, you see other bumps around that kind of look like 10, 20 percent. So uh, you really, I think, 15, 20 percent is the limit you can go in a Sanger and be confident that it's real. So they would have trouble if it was like five percent. They couldn't verify it with a Sanger. But there are other other methods that they have to use. But uh, so verification is very important. So we decided it was time to start a clinical trial. Um, we used the PACBA, as I said, because it was the only fast turnaround instrument we had. We, we targeted just 19 genes, and I'll say why in a sec, um, and uh, try and do somewhere around 80 patients. We've actually did about 90. These patients were uh, advanced recurrent or metastatic disease, so these are people that have already been treated, as you'll see, uh, and the cancer has come back multiple times, in fact. Um, they have to be a candidate for a clinical trial, so at Princess Margaret, across the street from us, they'll have many, many clinical trials going on. And the idea here is the they got to do something with this patient, so they're going to put them on a clinical trial, and we're hoping to generate some information that'll help point them to the appropriate clinical trial, and increase the odds that they they will uh, uh, respond to it. And of course, they have to be interested and in, in give us informed consent. The CLIA lab, the CAP CLIA lab, it's in Toronto General Hospital, part of UHN that does the work for Princess Margaret. Uh, about a year and a half earlier, I put in a sequinome instrument. So this is a mass spe mass spec driven genotyping device. There is a, a panel, Oncocarta version 1, which screens 238 uh, mutations in 19 oncogenes. So this is a genotyping. So they're looking at specific mutations. So they won't, if it's, 
they don't look for it. It's like a microarray. If you don't look for it, you don't see it. So the idea was they would use this, we would do the sequencing, and we'd see if we find new things and also validate the sequencing. So the very first thing we did, we took 30 samples that they had characterized. Um, they characterized them uh, by Sanger sequencing, so they knew these mutations were there. They would also done it on the Oncocarta, and this was the PAC bio circular consensus. And we found all, but we missed, uh, missed one of them. I think that's been moved. It's here. We missed this one. Um, and it turned out that it was just our Amplicon here wasn't amplifying well, so we fixed that. So we were able to detect them all. So that was the first thing, just to see that does, does the PAC bio detect well, the knowns that were there. So this is the, the pipeline that we started. So the patient gets consented. Uh, you have to collect a, a new biopsy. The, most of these you'll see required a, a radiologist. Uh, then went to the pathology department to uh, assess the, to confirm the diagnosis, also assess if there was tumor there. They would mark it up and show us where the tumor was because we're no good at that. Send it over to the, the CLIA lab. They would uh, actually just scrape off the part that's the tumor, so macro dissect it, uh, and extract the DNA. They would send us the DNA, and we would sequence it. Uh, they would run the sequinome, and then, as you'll see, we generate a genomics report, goes to the clinician, and, and hopefully use to treat the patient. The goal is to do all this in three weeks. Um, and it usually took a week just to get to here. Right? So obviously, the sequencing has to be fast, and that was one of the keys why we had to use a fast turnaround engine. Once we had the, the sequence, uh, we met weekly, uh, a panel here, which is about a dozen people who are made up of, of genomicists, uh, bioinformatics, and uh, clinicians. We had to have uh, a quorum of at least six, three of which had to be a clinician to come up with any decision. Uh, I'll talk about this pipeline a little bit later, but this side here, we'd look at the somatic mutations. Uh, they'd be verified in the CLIA lab, where we decide what needs to be verified in the CLIA lab, uh, and then a final report would be made to the oncologist based on uh, what we felt was actionable and reportable. Big question is how to interpret and report the data that was part of doing all this. A lot of there was just logistics to set up at the very beginning. Um, one of the things was just uh, this tracking system here. So you've got three different, you've got the OICR, uh, Toronto General Hospital, and Princess Margaret, and you just need to be able to communicate between those three centers. There's a lot of firewalls to go across, so that was a, a chore in itself. Uh, we set up how we could track the samples. But we also had to come up with some curation of the things we would find. So it was fairly straightforward because there were 19 genes, 238 mutations, and there were a bunch of clinical fellows who were interested in, in curating it. So we built some tools to help them pre-populate a database. They went in and, and we split it between them, and they actually curated them. But there is a lot that we pulled in that's not curated, and this will be a, a bigger problem in the future. So uh, very specific targets here, everything here. Um, and what is the consequence of these mutations has to be figured out. The report back to the clinician, this is a paper, uh, it's, can't read it here, but it's probably hopefully illegible on your thing, uh, Stephen Friend. Um, this is the type of information you could report back to the clinician. Uh, it would be pretty much worthless to do this. Uh, you know, nobody's got the time to go through, this is more of a research project, to go through all this information to come up with a diagnosis. So our goal is to try and give something more of a, a standard um, report that might come out of the CLIA lab for any test that they do. Uh, they do uh, Sanger-based sequencing for other mutations. And give them an idea of the mutation, its frequency and various tumor types, a little bit about it, uh, some of the characteristics of it, some references, and importantly, what clinical trials uh, were available and what, if they know what the outcome of those clinical trials were. So this is the sort of report that would get vetted by that um, expert panel and passed on to the clinician. So just from the, the data here, oops, sorry why that happened. But anyway, um, I'm going to have to skip around here. Is the printed version look better? Yeah, sorry. Um, we had set some goals for ourselves. We wanted uh, at least 50% of the patients to um, uh, consent. Hopefully they would, they would agree. But you can see we got a very uh, good take rate. So we approached 56. Over here is this number here. 51 were consented. Uh, 50 were enrolled. Uh, one, uh, I forgot why one didn't. I think they got too sick to, to continue. Um, 49 of them, we got a successful biopsy, so 98% of them with success, successful biopsy. Median age of the patient was 57. Uh, median time with metastatic disease is 17 months. Uh, under here is the median number of previous treatments, so they'd been through three rounds of chemo on average. The outlier was eight. Uh, and the, the samples that we got were a median cellular, cellularity of 60%, so it's one of the reasons you didn't see 50-50 in that. 
Uh, they were all solid, solid tumors only, it's not uh, no leukemias, and uh, the majority were the common ones that they see, but we took them from pretty much all comers, anyone they felt was eligible for a clinical trial. Um, this is just showing, sorry for the overlap here, this is just the tissue sites that were uh, biopsied from, and this blue, blue part here is the, the radiologist, so most of them required radiology. This was sort of the bedside clinician doing it, and one was from surgery. <coughs> so the first thing was, I don't know why this happened, but it's been translated from one computer to another, um, that uh, was whether or not we could get DNA. So if we got a successful biopsy, uh, in most of them there was tumor present. There were a few biopsies where there was not tumor present. Rebiopsy on some of them uh, got, got tumor. We, could we get sufficient DNA? So if we got tumor, we usually got DNA from it, and uh, this from either the archival blocks, as I'll talk about in a minute, we get lots. FFD, we could get a decent amount. Of course, from blood, you get a ton. A lot of variation, but we got enough to, to analyze. Yeah, that one's better. Um, these are, this is the numbers from above, just repeated anyways here. Uh, if we got DNA, we were able to analyze it 100% of the time. Uh, mutations found, so about a third of the patients, we found mutations in those 19 genes. Uh, these actual mutations were mostly what we found. As you'll, I'll point out, show you that we found some novel ones as well. And our goal was to turn that around in three weeks, like I said. In those first 50 patients, we only got two-thirds of them back in three weeks. But if you were to look at the, over time, early on, we, it took us longer as we were to learn how to do it. And sort of the last um, third of it, we hit that three-week, in fact, often turned around in two weeks. So uh, we felt it was pretty successful in that we were able to show that we can actually do this and generate sequence. Interesting thing was, we, when available, we got archival tissue as well. So there are 29 of the 50 that we could readily get some archive, ar archival tissue. Uh, there were three of which did not match, and they're, they're listed here. Here's one. This one's uh, kind of interesting. This is a, a cervical tumor. Uh, the primary tumor, uh, we, sent, we sequenced the archive, found a PIK3CA mutation. In the metastatic lesion that was biopsied for our, uh, our study, we found a PIK3CA mutation, but it was a different mutation. So the, the treatment had uh, killed off these cells, and these cells had come back, but both with a PIK3CA mutation. And we also saw one where we, uh, the, the, the original tumor had a RET mutation here, none detected here, and we had a primary lung where there was no mutation detected in those 19 genes, but then uh, two EGFR mutations appeared in the, the metastatic tumor. This is a, a summary of what we found. Um, there was concordance between the sequinome and the PAC bio results. But because we're sequencing the whole gene, uh, we actually saw some things that they didn't see. So these are mutations that are not on the uh, sequinome panel. Uh, and these were val validate, validated in the, uh, or verified in the CLIA lab, so that they weren't uh, artifacts of our sequencing. And I'm going to talk about this one. So this is the 18th patient that we looked at. It was a 48-year-old woman, metastatic breast cancer, ER positive, HER2 positive. Um, she had uh, metastatic disease in the chest wall, lymph nodes, bone, and lung. Uh, had been through many rounds of chemo, and uh, we detected a novel mutation here in AKT1. No, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. So we validated it. This is actually the traces from from my lab, so you can see it there. Uh, and it was also validated in the CLIA lab uh, with Sanger. So we were able to detect it. This is where this is it. So this is AKT1. Uh, there are known mutate driver mutations or activating mutations in AKT1 right here, E17K. Um, this was down here in the kinase domain. So it's novel in that uh, this is not in DB sniff or anything like that. It's, it's a somatic variant, it's not a germline variant. Uh, it's novel in that I can't find anything in the literature on it. It's not in cosmic. Uh, it's not any database. Uh, so we have no idea. You can see it's highly conserved region. Uh, it's a fairly significant change, charge change here, um, and it's down in the kinase domain. Is it activating or inactive? No idea. We're doing some functional studies. The preliminary results looks like it is activating. Um, clearly, if it's inactivating, there's no point in giving them an AKT1 inhibitor. It's already inhibited. Um, but uh, they did treat them. Um, the pathologist will hate this because don't, don't look at me. Um, I was getting in trouble with that. I, these aren't mine. Uh, they were treated with an mTOR inhibitor. Uh, they did show some tumor shrinkage. The, this is the tumor. The reason this is that they don't look is because this is two different planes. Right? So uh, it looks smaller, but it, it did actually shrink. 
Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the patient uh, developed some infiltrates, uh, was taken off the, uh, the drug, um, lung infiltrates, and it turned out it was, it was still the cancer coming back. And they were just too sick to survive the treatment. So this patient passed away, but they were starting to respond. So uh, potentially that was some benefit. This pathway here is something we haven't dealt with. So we, we limited ourselves to 19 genes. Um, that seems like a small number, and it is. Only a third of the patients should be actually find medication in. And what we're scaling up to will do more genes. But we didn't want to have to deal with too much of this. So we, st we limited ourselves to what we were sequencing. This is, uh, if you sequence a lot, and this, this is very controversial in the, in the community. So even if we did, whole, we did whole genome on all these patients, um, we would find a lot of things that had nothing to do with their cancer. So we're interested in treating their cancer at first, right? Because uh, we want to get them on some kind of treatment. Well, we may find things that uh, have to do with their overall health or their family health, um, which may be important. And their big question in the community is, you know, do we report these back? Are we responsible to report these back? So we gave ourselves a longer time frame to, we want to deal with these quickly. These ones that could be validated. There may be more of them. Um, we could verify them in the CLIA lab and pass them on if we felt it was information for the, important to the patient. By restricting ourselves to those 19 genes, we, we found germline mutations in those, but they're just no common PPSNP entries. Uh, so we didn't bother reporting any of any of the germline because we didn't find anything that was significant. Um, but as we expand it, we're going to start finding things. And so the big question is, how do you deal with this? Uh, and, uh, I don't have the answer. And it is, it is going to be an important problem because um, when you sequence an exome of any individual, you'll find, this is just from look at a few papers in the literature, you'll find roughly around 100 to 200 genes that have potentially deleterious mutations in them. If you sequence the whole genome, these are, you know, 600 genes that you would predict that the person has a significant impact on that gene. So it's something we have to deal with. The future challenges, uh, we started with 200 genes, or 20 genes, we're gonna go up to 200, then 1,000, once you get up in this range, you might as well do the whole exome, and, and, you know, and it's actually easier to do a whole genome than a whole exome from small samples. Uh, but, uh, so eventually we'll go here. This is just driven by cost. It gets more, a little more expensive going this way. Uh, it only costs about five times more to do a genome than an exome. Um, so cost differential is not huge, but it's still important. Uh, we'd like to include transcriptome information, structural variation, we haven't included that so far. Uh, we're constantly looking at new technologies as they come out. As I said, well, I think we pretty much got this one uh, worked out. We, we can make libraries pretty small amounts. This is important. When choosing how we're going to, if we're going to look at 200 genes, how do we isolate them? I gave you a few examples of some of the methods. Um, in the clinical arena, we want to get 100% <coughs> coverage. We don't want to have gaps and holes. And it may not be that any one technology does that for you. You may have to do, you know, a halo flex that showed you only get 97% coverage. You may fill that in with some PCR or something like that. So it might be a combined approach. All right, so just the last few slides here. Um, data complexity, you see there's lots of different platforms. Uh, we got many terabytes per single instrument run, so you get huge amounts of data being generated. Um, you'll learn how to deal with some of that. Uh, there's, I think I have another slide coming up, but there's, you know, the, the high seek puts out uh, terabytes of data per run. Uh, it's fairly daunting. Most of that, after analysis, you don't need to actually there are four human genomes on this thumb drive. So you know, once you get down to what you want to analyze, it's not so bad. Um, very complex. We talked about all the different things in RNA-seq, for example. Uh, this is very difficult. There's, there are software packages, and none of them are great uh, for looking at these sorts of things. And validation is a huge problem. We're in, not, no longer looking at a couple things to validate. You've got thousands of things to validate. And of course, uh, as you'll be learning through this course, there's a bigger picture to consider. So just because we found some mutations uh, you know, in AKT1 or something like that, then uh, there's all these other pathways. There's ways that the, the cells can get around your inhibitor, et cetera. So you have to take the whole big picture into concept, and we'll talk about that with pathway analysis. Data privacy. Like I said, there's four human genomes on here. It's not encrypted. should be. Uh, but they are, um, uh, these, these genomes are uh, in the public domain. So it's, there's not an issue there. But uh, obviously, clinical information needs to be detected protected clearly, uh, you know, person's name, their address, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but what about sequence data? So if you've got a genome sequence, you can identify the person. It's not a trivial matter. You can't just look at the sequence and tell who it is. Uh, but there is information in the sequence that you can use. And there's been examples of, uh, you, you know, you can, for example, it's called surname leakage. You can 
uh, by looking at the, the Y chromosome, you can determine uh, with some accuracy what the likely surname, at least their ancestral, you know, where they're from in the world, and uh, potentially what their surname is. Um, and in fact, one there was a case, and it's quite old now, probably about six years ago, uh, a young boy who was adopted, wanted to find his biological father, uh, had his Y chromosome sequence, there's a company that'll do that for you, compared to the database, and from that got a likely surname and where the, the geographically his roots were from, and he was actually able to track down his biological father with that, and that started this whole storm of, of you know, encrypting sequence data. But it is, it is a big concern. Um, the best thing you can do is in, encrypt. So when we ship sequences around, we encrypt them, uh, make sure that, the, that they're protected as much as possible. And uh, the big problem, which might be my last slide, the big problem uh, is actually integrating on them. We'll learn how to do some of that here, talk about pathways, for example. But there's all these different data types that you can put together, including bringing in the clinical data uh, and then all the validation follow-up you have to do. So on a clinical standpoint, this, you know, all of this information can eventually be brought into, into play to come up with a uh, list of targets here, therapeutic targets, and then from the research side, uh, we're trying to find significant pathways in a cancer.